Uh, we're going to speak to Faisabad MP and UNC Shadow Minister of Health, Dr. Lakram Bodum. Uh, of course, first time on The Observer, so we're going to wish him a special good evening. Plus, a good evening to you, sir. Very good evening to you, Mikey, and your listeners on The Observer. Thank you and so you much. Thank you. Um, the PAHO NICU report, uh, the health minister has made it clear in the parliament uh, yesterday, I believe, or the day before, he, he laid the PAHO report adding almost all the recommendations in the report had already been part of the National Action Plan. Uh, I mean, he went on to say that the Ministry of Health and the Northwest Regional Health Authority, having gone through the report, inclusive of the findings and recommendations, note that many of the recommendations contained within the report were already integral parts of the national and regional standard operating procedure. So my question is quite clear, and I'm sure all the viewers are asking the same thing. Now, if the recommendations were already incorporated into the procedure, why wouldn't they be in practice? So that's a very good question, um, my fee. And the, so the report was laid on Friday in the Parliament. Um, this, and of course, you will recall that these deaths occurred in the month of April, just to, just to reflect for the benefit of those who are listening. Um, but what was most alarm alarming, of course, is the fact that between April 2nd and April 9th, in that seven-day period, you had seven deaths. Now, the report clearly states that the most likely cause of these deaths was sepsis, meaning infection, um, and it's likely to be a blood infection. Now, on laying the report, the Minister of Health, as is his right, made a statement in the Parliament. And I was most surprised at the statement, because the statement... Um, failed to mention all of the shortcomings that were found in the NICU um, unit at Port of Spain Hospital. Instead, the minister chose to, um, to, to highlight one or two things which, which are positive. And, you know, we don't want to knock everything. I mean, there's a lot good happening in the health service in Trinidad. Right. But this, this particular report is, is very worrisome to me. And the question in the minds of the population is if all of these things were already in place, so have been put in place, why did these babies die? And I just want to leave that here. But, my kid, there's another, another development that took place on, on Saturday. I, no, I believe on Sunday. Now, on Saturday, all, of, all three newspapers simply published the findings of this report, um, which were very worrisome to everyone. Looking at all the shortcomings, 25% compliance in NICU, for example, 12 issues there in the new intensive care unit, including some very simple things, lack of sanitizers, little, you know, lack of basic, uh, you know, protocols and, and so on in terms of preventing and controlling infection. Um, so those were, those were the, so that was the media on Saturday, just highlighting as they got it on Friday in the Parliament. But then on Sunday, I saw a worrisome development where the minister now is coming, and I see one report here um, saying that um, the Alsing says data from Pahu Niku report being cherry picked and is actually trying to blame the public and the media um, for reporting on what's, you know, what's simply reported from the report. And then I saw another media report here. I mean, I, I'm just saying that these headlines are wrong, but it's here in print, you know, my Kiki. The Alsing slums Pahu probe into Niku deaths. So I think this is a worrisome development. I think all of Trinidad and Tobago should be very worried by this development. Um, in terms of the minister trying to deflect, um, as is the practice of this government, of course. Yeah, to yeah, and, and, and Dr. Bori, you're correct. And I think that was the, the, the concern of many people that at some point in time during this process, um, you know, we gave them the benefit of the doubt and hope that things were not going to be, of course, sanitized or diluted in any form or fashion. But now that it has been presented, rather than dealing with those core aspects where the percentage rate was low, uh, again, they're looking for some sort of scapegoat. Because uh, he described the media focus of the NICU score of 29 as misinformation. But apparently he isn't aware that in the area where the score was 29% is the main area that is present concern and where the problem lies. Wouldn't it be better to basically focus on that rather than saying, listen, someone is trying their best to undermine or, or, or you know, try to, to dilute this or sanitize it? There's a problem. And at 29%, here's where the focus should be. That's what we expect as citizens coming out of this report, that where the core problem lies, that is the problem that they must deal with. 
Mikey, I have I have to agree with you fully on this matter. Now I'll tell you something. I mean, besides being a politician, besides being a member of parliament, I am also trained as a medical doctor for 40 years. When this report was laid in the parliament, I went through this report in detail. The public is to be reminded that listen, um, the government asked Pahu for assistance. The assistance was provided by way of three professionals who are, who are very ably qualified to do such a report. In fact, one of them, um, Professor of Pediatrics, one is a specialist in microbiology, which deals with the germs in the blood and so on. And the other person, the third person, is actually the head of a neonatal intensive care unit at Barbados. So she would be very familiar with the local, um, the local settings and standards and so on. And I looked at the I looked at the methodology, therefore to assess whether the, the findings could have been valid in this report, and they used very um, methodology and methods which are acceptable by international standards. This is PAHO, which supplies services and technical advice to 35 member countries across the, the Pan American um, the, this hemisphere. So I am I am satisfied, and those who I have discussed with fellow professionals are satisfied that the quality of the report is good. So therefore, having said that, we have to look now at the findings of the report. You know, the, the minister indicated that this one wasn't interviewed and that one wasn't interviewed. Mikey, this is about finding objective evidence of what went wrong. This is about finding whether people introduced infection in the NICU, whether they took the precautions, and the team rightfully did direct observation and some interviews, and they simply, they simply reported on what they found. And, you know, another point that was made by Mr. Eddie Stewart, the, the president of the nurses at the TNT National Nurses Association, is that <coughs> despite the fact that the NICU was aware of, the, of, the, of this team coming to do, you know, an investigation, Maybe for a week they had some time to do some further cleansing, and yet the shortcomings were, were, were there. So it, it, it makes you wonder what the situation would have been prior to these deaths occurring, Mikey. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, if anyone is cherry picking here, it would have to be, of course, the administration uh, led by the health minister. Because in the areas where the scores were high, like 80 and what have you, it seems to have no problem with that whatsoever. But where they fell short and where the report highlighted that things could have been done better, um, there seems to be an issue here where you play the blame game, apparently, and shifting the, the entire thing onto other individuals or whoever it is that they want to blame at this time. Because I'll tell you something, there are wars taking place in this world, and at no period of time, a very short period of time, have there been so many babies dying, whether it be in Ukraine or whether it be in the Gaza. So here in Trinidad, I, I, it reminds me of my grandmother saying, children don't ask to come here, and they certainly don't ask to come here to suffer. Somebody has to pay the price for this. And if they didn't get a chance to interview who they didn't get to interview, who, who prevented them from conducting these interviews? Well, that is a very good question. But you see, the further point, Mikey, and, and the population needs to understand this, this is a report based on the scientific evidence, based on what was found. Um, so you don't, have to re you don't have to interview anybody, for example, to see that there are no policies or procedures for high-level disinfection for equipment such as laryngoscopes. I just use that as one example. Now, a laryngoscope is a little instrument that is used to put a tube into the baby's throat to help them to breathe. Now, these are premature babies. They need all the support. They need full support to have a chance. If that laryngoscope is not properly, that instrument is not properly sanitized, it means by the same act that you are trying to, to assist the infant, you can introduce a bacteria and the, the baby can get sepsis and die. So this is just one example of the 12 shortcomings found in the NICU. And there are many others. You know, the simple things like is worrisome. Limited hands, free alcohol based hand rub dispensers in the queue. You know, it is it is well it, it, you know it is well known that hand sanitization is one of the most important thing. It is it is healthcare workers and, and visitors, parents on who will bring infection into the NICU and we, this is well known and therefore we have to take all steps to prevent that. Yeah. Uh, so, one thing we've learned from COVID is that this has basically come uh, become part of our new normal uh, way we of course sanitizing and uh, washing of hands and what have you and those things are so basic i mean one would i don't think you really as you said you don't need to conduct an interview with that 
one would know that basically that is required uh, once you're working in certain areas. And the NICU, of course, is, is a place that you would be quite aware of that. Now, the health, thing, the health minister also said very early in the report, it said many of these babies were severely premature. And in addition to being severely premature, they were severely underweight. And there were challenges posed by that. So let's talk, let's address that front. Please. Uh, Mikey, let's address that front. It, it is a well-known fact that babies under a certain weight and under a certain number of weeks in terms of what you call prematurity have a limited chance of surviving. The, the commonest reasons for these babies dying would be what we call respiratory failure, which is why you have to put them on a ventilator. Um, the, some of these babies are born with what you call congenital abnormalities. Interestingly, this report clearly states clearly states that the, the reason, the most likely reason um, for the deaths of these babies, and they're speaking about the investigation here, um, would have been sepsis. So in other words, the report, although there may have been some cases where it may have been difficult to save some of these babies and so on, but it says here, and I quote from the report, I have it right in front of me here, with the available information, an increase in the NICU mortality in the month of April can be seen, and it says possibly related to the increase in the cases of sepsis. So it is saying here that there seems to be a direct link between this cluster of seven deaths in seven days and sepsis. And we know sepsis or infection is one of the commonest challenges for these premature babies. So it's not, it's not, you know, it's not adequate alone to say, well, listen, these babies are so premature and they say, they will die anyhow. That is not the approach we should be using, um, especially when we, when we are given the responsibility of treating with the most vulnerable in our society. I, and I agree with you. I agree. I, I think that to be so insensitive to say, listen, these babies weren't born a certain way, so there was nothing we could do for them and what have you. I mean, we're talking about professionals here. And I agree with you from the start of this interview. I am not here to throw any of those medical professionals under the bus, especially not the nurses. But I do believe that we are paying a price for things that were discussed many times before in the past and for whatever reason was never considered to be important when it came to dealing with the nursing staff and all these medical professionals. Because it says that the power team noted that there were not enough nursing professionals in relation to the number of patients, example, preterm babies, describing the professional nurse to patient ratio as consistently inadequate. I mean, how are our nurses being treated in this country? We've always had some sort of a brain drain where they, they take up some position, whether it be in the UK, whether it be in some part of North America, or whatever the case may be. And, and these are good professional people who go beyond the call of duty. And, and it seems now that there's a culture of just working hard enough to remain hired and just good enough not to be fired. And that cannot be acceptable, especially in the NICU. Mikey, there's a big issue with nurses. I agree with you completely that the nurses have been disincentivized. They've certainly not been incentivized to stay in Trinidad and Tobago. I know of many nurses who have left simply, and they, and they want to stay here. They want to work in their own country, um, but they're just not being treated properly. Now, I mean, and, and this is, this, if, you, if you remember the findings of the COVID-19 um, Simongal report, in, which came, was laid in 2022, two years ago, one of the one of the issues was the shortage of nursing staff again in the in the ICU, and that you know could have led to some of the some of the deaths um, that occurred. So that was an issue that was two years ago was highlighted, and obviously nothing has been done to address it. In terms of training of nursing staff, um, you would remember that under the partnership government we had the Eldorado School of Nursing. I asked the question whether that school is still functioning. I believe it it isn't. So, you know, we are not creating the opportunities for nurses um, under the partnership government as well. Um, the initiative was taken to bring nurses from Cuba and so on, some of the highly specialized nurses. I don't know whether that is still being followed. But it comes down to our issue of resources and priorities. It comes down to the priority of this government in terms of where they choose to spend money. And I don't want to go there, Mikey, but the thing is, it is true. You see, when you decide that you, you, you want to spend $132 million on a car park, 
or you want to spend over 400 million on an administration building for the Ministry of Health, you know, if you have unlimited funds or you have a pool, that's fine. But when it is now you're talking here about basic, um, you know, basic stuff not being available in the hospitals, and this is NICU, and we hear all the time for the issues where you can't get drugs and so on. So it's part of a bigger problem. I agree with you. Yeah, and and I, think, I think the big part uh, here is, is management. Because again, um, you know, you spoke about it, but I just want to highlight the fact that in the report, it placed the hospital environment and sanitation at 64%. I mean, that's, that's on any given day. That's overall. It's not to say on that particular day or at 64%. I mean, you have restaurants that you go to and every hour somebody comes in to clean and sanitize the bathroom. They write a report. They place it there. Listen, this is sanitized at whatever percentage. We are at a hospital, at an NICU. Are you telling me that these things are not implemented, that you can actually pick up a chart uh, at whatever hour and realize, well, okay, Harry passed there, everything was clean, everything was wiped down, uh, everything was sanitized? Uh, I, I mean, why? Why is that so difficult? No, and, and you're right. It speaks to governance. In any other setting, Mikey, in any other country, the board of the regional health authority would have gone already. You know, I was chairman of the Southwest Regional Health Authority, and one of the greatest challenges for any hospital, any health sector, is the issue of infection. There's something called HAI, which the population needs to get familiar with. It means hospital-acquired infection. One of the biggest risks that patients face is they can go into a hospital, they can get, you know, a surgery done, perfect surgery, and they can acquire an infection, not necessarily from the surgery, but affecting the surgery from the hospital itself, and that can, that can cause complications for them. So infection IPC, which is what you'll be seeing in this report, infection prevention and control is a big issue in hospitals. And under my watch in SWRG and all the other RHGs at that time, there was something called an infection prevention control subcommittee. The board has subcommittees under the chairman and the CEO and so on to look at these things. And one of the shortcomings of this report is here under organization compliance. It says there are no personnel responsible for IPC at high level within the hospital. How can that be? That is worrisome. That is very worrisome. So in other words, at the very top level of governance, something seems to have fallen down here. Yeah, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm gathering from this report, uh, basically this indictment is basically on the board itself. Uh, I, I mean, you're not talking about any medical personnel. Uh, is that something you believe may be a hard pill to swallow for uh, Mr. Dial Singh? Because w when you look at it, there are other shortcomings. That, I mean, early breast milk feeds were not being instituted. Uh, the NIC unit dose medications were not prepared in sterile conditions by the hospital pharmacy. Now, these are basic things. These are basic things that are also laid in this report. Is this an indictment on the health minister? It is. It is certainly an indictment on the health minister and the government. Doctors and nurses, uh, my key during my training some years ago, I would have worked in an EQ for some 15 months. So I know exactly what is involved. I know doctors and nurses give off their very best because you're treating and you're dealing with very vulnerable infants. And, but as a doctor, as a healthcare professional, you can only work with the resources and within the limits of the resources you're provided. You make the recommendations, but if you are not provided with the resources, then you, you know, you, in other words, you want me to do a job, but you're tying one of my hands behind my back and you're saying, go ahead and do this job. This is what it is akin to. Yeah. And, and again, so now we're at a point where you know, the health minister is saying, listen, yeah, we fail. The report is here. We dropped the ball. However, and, and that's the problem. You see, that however, that, that transitional uh, expression that is always at the end of many of these reports that has shown that somebody just was not efficient enough, not capable enough, not being able to manage good, 
it comes with the however the babies were premature um the staff wasn't well trained uh we didn't have enough nurses and i i don't think at this point in time we can accept excuses for this if you drop the ball and especially based on this report where they themselves seem to be cherry picking as we mentioned they have a problem with 29 percent but where it is that they had the higher percentage they're not making that an issue i mean are we ever going to get to the point of understanding that the patients, the people who pay taxes, the people who are coming for medical care must be treated in a manner and things must be implemented to make sure to secure their lives. Are I, we ever going to get there? No, I agree with you. This is, this, is, this is totally about accountability and how willing this minister and this government is in terms of accounting to the people. Um, th this is this is an issue that needs to be addressed at the management level. I think you have hit the nail on the head. I think the management fell down in this case. I am in no way going to blame doctors and nurses here and healthcare workers because I know that doctors and nurses and healthcare workers, under very difficult circumstances, try their very best. They are not the professionals are busy. They are not the kinds to walk on the street and complain, you know, and walk with a placard. But it doesn't mean that they are happy with everything everything that's taking place. There's certainly many challenges, and, and I agree with you. I mean, why can't the government, why can't the minister and the government accept this report, the very report they requested, they agree that power should do the investigation. It's an independent investigation. The facts are there. Why can't they just deal with it, you know, and correct what needs to be corrected and bring closure to those parents who have been so, 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 so affected in this matter? Yeah, I guess it's difficult for people to face that reality that, listen, we fail. I mean, with seven dead babies, we fail. Families that have been affected, we failed at that. Uh, and what we, we were not even sure, based on the report, because here it is again, there's all this conversation taking place without zeroing on exactly where things need to change. So will we have a repeat of this, God forbid, in the near future? And that is a worrisome thing, Mikey. That is a worrisome thing that the government and the minister has failed to come to the parliament and say, listen, we got the report, I'm going to do this, we are going to provide the resources, we are going to get more nurses. This is what I expected to hear in the minister's statement on, fr on Friday. Uh, I did not expect to hear, listen, we already implemented breastfeeding and be happy because we have some kind of infection prevention thing at the high level and so on. I would have wanted to hear, listen, we're going to make every effort to provide the one-to-one -one nursing care that is required to provide all of these resources, the simple things, you know, the hand sanitizers, whatever, and so on, and to provide the resources. That is what I expected to hear. I expected to hear that, you know, those who are responsible at the level of, the, of governance, you know, at the level of management, will be held accountable. This is what the population wants to know, as you correctly pointed out, Mikey, that we don't want to have this scenario in six months again, or 12 months down the road. Yeah. You're right. Closing comments, go right ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I want to say that I have perused this report. I think it's a, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's based on the science. Um, I think, you know, I would, I would want to discourage the Minister of Health at this point in time from trying to, you know, to, to use the report, you know, as a scapegoat and to address these issues in the report frontally and to give the commitment to the population um, that whatever needs to be done, you know, will be done to protect. I mean, those unfortunate babies are gone. But I mean, whatever needs to be done to protect those who will be in a simpler situation on a daily basis, not only in the NICU or the Port of Spain General Hospital, but in all the other new deal intensive care units in this country, whether it is at the Mount Hope Women's Hospital, at the Sandy Grandi Hospital now, which has some intensive care, I believe, and of course at the San Fernando General Hospital. So this provides a great opportunity for all these units and the procedures and protocols to be reviewed as we go forward to try to you know, provide the best care for the most vulnerable in our society. All right. Thank you so much. Best of luck to you and your entire team. Keep up the good work. And we'll be yeah. checking with you periodically. Thank you so Thank much. You